I, uh, oh, I am on. Uh, I grew up in, uh, professionally in Cambridge, Massachusetts, working at a software company in the early 80s. The weather was always like it was today. The joy in the room was always like it was today. Those were fond memories. So I'm glad to be back talking to software people. The essence of what I want to talk to you about is the name of my talk, which is if there are marketers in the room, you can go. This is for the people who actually make stuff and do things. And it's inspired by... Uh, two people who I steal from on a daily basis who you're going to hear from at this conference. People who are living out loud the kinds of ideas I want to share with you. And I want to start by showing you in 1983, when I got my first job at Spinnaker Software, what it meant to market computer stuff. Why buy just a video game from Atari on television? Invest what it meant was you buy TV ads. What it meant was you make a cheap product and you figure out how to tell people cool stuff with a cool spokesperson over and over again. And I came here today with a lot of warnings for you, guidelines, things that you need to worry about. But most of all, I really want to help you understand that there's a fundamentally different way of thinking about this problem. The good news is that these are the smartest people I'm going to talk to for a long time. That lots of times when I give a talk like this, I have to go really slow and connect all the dots. But I don't have to do that with you. So I'm going to go really fast. And I'm going to try to leave plenty of time at the end for questions. But I hope you can keep up because here we go. The idea is that, uh, well, let's go back to 1913. In 1913, Otto Rowetter invented the greatest thing, sliced bread. And... Before that, I have no idea what the greatest thing was. But after he invented it, that became the greatest thing. Why was it the greatest thing? Well, it was an engineering solution to a difficult everyday problem. And what Otto did after he invented it was he made sure he had patents and trademarks and intellectual property protection so no one would be able to steal his idea. He made sure that the factory was up and running, that he had... Uh, offices, not even cubicles for all of his programmers. He made sure that everything was set up the way it should be so that when all the orders came in for sliced bread, he'd be ready. And from 1913, when he got the patent, until 1930, when the patent ran out, sliced bread was a total failure. And it was a failure because no one cares about sliced bread. No one wakes up in the morning going, oh, can't wait to get me some of that sliced bread. It wasn't until Wonder came along in 1931 when they packaged sliced bread and advertised sliced bread and marketed sliced bread and figured out that sliced bread built strong bodies 12 ways. That was the day that sliced bread actually became the greatest thing. The invention of sliced bread is irrelevant. The marketing of sliced bread mattered then because of four words, ideas that spread win. If everybody knew how great your software is, you'd be done, but they don't. That what we see in every line of work, whether you're coffee, intellectual, TV business, the internet business, go down the list. All these people have power and influence and authority, whether or not you agree with their politics, for one reason. Because everyone knows their idea. And that what you do for a living, you didn't realize it till just now, what you do for a living is spread ideas that you've already taken care of figuring out how to write a piece of code that doesn't crash. You've already taken care of finding a shortcut to increase productivity. That's not what you do. What you do is spread ideas. That's your job. You have to get over this idea that you are in the function business. Function isn't the point. I don't know how many of you saw this video that, went, that made the rounds about a month ago. Apparently, you could take three or four cell phones, uh, put some popcorn kernels in the middle, have your friends call them, and when they all rang at the same time, the radiation from the four phones would focus on the popcorn, and you could see it pop right before your very eyes. And these videos got seen 10, 20, 30, 40 million times, and it's not true, right? That, in fact, the whole thing was a hoax put on by a headset manufacturer. Now, it wasn't good marketing, but it was proof that ideas will spread far and wide, often separated from function, but that the winners are the people who have both, something that functions and an idea that spreads, right? And so my law here, I don't know why it says text there, but there you go, is this. <laughs> if, I made this up just for you guys, 
if you're going to bother making a piece of software, you better build the marketing into it or else don't bother. Software, more than any other product ever made, markets itself. Because software now, not back in 1983 when I was making it, but now software is not a solo activity using it. Software that connects spreads because you need to tell somebody else to use it to make it work. One person decides to install fog bugs, now a hundred people have to use it. You've got to figure out how to make the software connect or you shouldn't bother making it. That's your goal, spread ideas. Let's go back to the history of marketing. Born and built in Chicago. Home of the Jolly Green Giant, home of Charlie the Tuna. Home of a mindset for a hundred years in our culture, in our country, of TV. TV, TV thinking. TV thinking says, I'm the marketer, I'm in charge. I have the power to interrupt whoever I want, whenever I want, with any message I want, and you're going to watch it because there's only three channels. TV thinking, it's my billboard, I'll put what I want on it. It's my elevator, I'm going to put a TV in the elevator. There's an ad in the urinal because I paid for it. Right? That what TV thinking says is simple. And I'm going to show you this cycle. I'm going to use uh, cosmetics as an example. In 1947, a guy named Charles Revson in Tuckahoe, New York, bought a bunch of TV ads for Revlon, a little cosmetics company. Those TV ads helped Revlon get distribution for their cosmetics all around the country. That distribution helped them sell more cosmetics. And then Charles Revson did something brilliant. He bought more TV ads. And around and around and around it went. Every company you have ever heard of, you have heard of, if it's more than five years old, because of this. Cisco hires a salesperson. She makes a sales call. They make a little bit of money. What do they do with the money? Hire another salesperson, right? Buy a trade ad in a magazine. It gets you a meeting with an IT guy. You make a sale. What do you do with the money? Buy another trade ad. And around and around and around it goes. This leads to average products for average people, except for maybe Pop-Tarts. But the rest of them <laughs> carefully chosen to be average. Why? Because if you're going to interrupt everybody with an ad, it better be something everybody wants to buy. If you're going to interrupt everybody with a trade show booth, everybody with a billboard, it better be something everybody wants to buy. So what do you end up with? Average products for average people. There's a real cultural dynamic, because we all grew up with it, that says, I better make something for more people. Because if I can make it for more people, more people might buy it. And if more people buy it, I win. This picture is really fuzzy. I had a bad cold when I took it. But, all right. I show it to you because of that. Blue box in the upper middle center. The brand manager for that product spent $100 million last year interrupting us. $100 million on coupons and shelling allowances and TV ads and magazine ads and radio ads and spiffs. Why? Because her analgesic is 2% better than the competition. And she figured if I would just try it once, I'd use it for the rest of my life. And she'd earn back those $100 million. The bad news is this. The bad news is I don't have an analgesic problem anymore. I solved it 20 years ago. I buy the stuff in the yellow box or the generic. She's invisible. She doesn't exist. She doesn't exist because I'm not looking for her. And because I'm not looking, I don't see because there's too much clutter. There's too much noise. And the thing you have to get your arms around is you make a product that's in a blue box. Most of you are solving a problem that people don't think they have. And if people don't think they have the problem, they're not looking for a solution. And if they're not looking for a solution, you're invisible. Here's the premium sausage department at the Whole Foods Market. Right? Jimmy Dean is in a whole other section. That's how much variety they have. To make up for it, the tofu department. Do you remember when tofu came in only two flavors, plain and extra plain? <laughs> what is happening now is hyperclutter. What's happening now is where there used to be two or three competitors, there's 20 or 30. Where there used to be two or three websites, there's 3,000 or 4,000. Where there used to be one kind of Oreos, now there's 19. When there used to be only a couple things at Starbucks, now there's 19,000 varieties of beverages. Clutter is not your friend. Clutter is a real problem, especially if you're running a smallish company. 
Because there you are toiling away, trying to make a product that you think has better function, and no one cares. And even the people who care, you don't know who they are. And even if you know who they are, they're not listening to you because they're too busy. We have a serious problem here. <laughs> so, I want to talk for a minute about bottled water. Bottled water still, just barely, costs more than gasoline. It is tap water in a handy container. And we spent $6 billion on it last year. And it's a real testament to what marketing is at some levels. Because all bottled water is by law essentially the same. And yet, we're spending billions and billions of dollars for it. And we ostensibly care about brands. Here's Hydrate Magazine, 180 pages of ads and articles about water. So... If you're in the water business, it's bad news. Here's water salad. It's pureed romaine lettuce in a jar with orange food coloring. The thing to understand about water salad is that it's marketed by Coke Japan. And Coke Japan launches a major new product every 21 days. Why? Because there's so much clutter. They're dealing with clutter by making more clutter. How many of you work for a company that has more products than it did three years ago? Everybody, you're dealing with clutter by making more clutter. That's the cycle that we're stuck in. I don't even want to talk about this one. <laughs> so what we've ended up doing is branding ourselves to death. And if you have a marketing department, they've sold you hook, line, and sinker on giving them more money, more staff, more effort from you so that they can continue more of this. More clutter, more yelling, more getting in people's face. This is a painting by Caravaggio of the Medusa. Her hair in the mythology was made out of snakes. And the legend was that if you looked at her, you froze and turned to stone. And that's what your marketing department wants to have happen. That you run some magic ad, you have some magic trade show booth, something great happens, right? And the prospect freezes, unable to move until they give you money. And it doesn't happen. You know it doesn't happen. You read the newspaper today and you passed dozens of ads. You never even read them. You can't even remember what they were. You watched TV last week sometime. You saw a commercial that cost a million dollars. You can't even remember who the commercial was for. So what we've done as marketers, and you're guilty too, is we're spammers. Right? Spamming people over and over and over again with unanticipated, imperson sorry, unanticipated impersonal, irrelevant ads we don't want to get about stuff we're not interested in. And the problem with spamming people over and over again is the yield goes down and we end up making the wrong stuff. So now I can move on to the good news, having annoyed you for 15 minutes. The good news is in Canada. Not just in Canada, but almost all the way to the most beautiful place on earth, Algonquin Park. The problem is to get to Algonquin Park, you got to fly to Toronto and rent a car. You take the 401 and the 400 to Highway 11. Highway 11 is this outdoor strip mall. Right? It's one horrible place after another. A place that sells fireworks, another place that sells fireworks, a place that sells donuts and coffee, but no muffins. You can see everything's a little run down. Things are rusting because as you're driving down Highway 11, there's always one more place. We don't need to stop here. I can hold it in for a few more minutes. One more place. Oh, well, let's not get donuts from this guy. The next guy's donuts are even better. One more place. Here's a place that sells fireworks and propane in the same facility. <laughs> I didn't stay there very long. Then, <laughs> right next door is a place that sells gasoline, french fries, coffee, and donuts. Everybody is struggling. And yet, right in the middle of Highway 11 is a place that doesn't even have a name. It's a shack. It says Candy Shop on the front. And if you go in, and I went in by accident the first time, you'll meet this lovely lady named Rita. And Rita and her husband run this candy shop. And she'll give you a tour. They've got candies from all over the world, each individually wrapped, stuff with weird containers, stuff with weird names, other stuff with really weird names. And <laughs> then you go, if you spend a couple minutes talking to Rita, what you discover are three amazing facts. Fact number one, the average customer, average customer, spends 60 to $65 a visit. Number two, the place was so popular that people were pulling over on the southbound Highway 11, on the gravel, running across two lanes of traffic, a concrete Jersey barrier, two more lanes of traffic, risking their lives to buy licorice. So she opened a clone of the store across the street. And the third thing she'll tell you is that last year she and her husband took home $175,000 in profit. 
So the question you've got to ask yourself is, why is it so easy to get your friends and your relatives in your bank to give you money and encouragement to open a coffee shop on Highway 11 and so hard to be Rita? That if you think about the arguments you've had with the board, if you think about the conversations you've had with the people you work with, they all want you to be in the coffee business. But the secret of Highway 11, where we all live, is that people in the coffee business are in trouble. But the people who are doing something totally different than everyone else are doing great. And why? The answer, which we heard from Joel, has to do with southern France. Now, <laughs> moving from Canada to southern France, I planned a vacation a few years ago. My wife, a little aside, has transportation narcolepsy, which is a fictional disease that she got shortly after we got married. And <laughs> it, it, it causes her to fall asleep in any moving vehicle unless there's a really good movie on the plane. So, we missed a flight, we missed a connection. 18 hours later, we're almost where we're going. And for 18 hours, my kids have been making a ruckus. And for 18 hours, my wife has been asleep. <laughs> so the weather was just like today. It was beautiful. And we're driving through this pasture like Monet painted it. And my wife's asleep and the kids have been making a ruckus the whole time. And as we drive into this pasture, I notice it's quiet in the back seat. I look in the rearview mirror hoping they're finally asleep. They're not asleep. They're staring out the window, transfixed by this perfect specimen of a cow for about three seconds. And then they went back to making a ruckus. You know why? Because cows are boring. You've seen one cow, you've seen five cows, five cows, ten cows. They're all the same. But what if it had been a purple cow? What if out the window there had been a real honest-to-goodness purple cow? I would have pulled over. My wife would have woken up. What's going on? I would have gotten on the cell phone, called people back home, told them I was looking at a purple cow. Right? My kids would have ignored me as usual, opened the door, run across the street, hopped over the fence, run over to the cow and rubbed it to make sure it was really and truly purple so they could tell their friends at show and tell that they had touched a purple cow. Because a purple cow is remarkable, worth making a remark about. If your software is remarkable, people will talk about it. Especially if talking about it makes the software work better. And if they talk about it, you get past the spam filter, you get past Medusa, you get past the bottled water, you get past all the noise and all the clutter, because one human being saying something to another human being matters. Let's give you some examples. Here are two cars. They don't have a lot in common. The Mini small enough to put in the trunk of the Hummer. But for four years, they had waiting lists. For four years, they sold at full retail. For four years, they made a profit. You know why? Because they're at the edges. At the edges, people wait in line. In the middle, for the average stuff, not so interested. That circle, that's how much BMW Corporation spends advertising each car they sell in the United States to the same scale Lincoln Mercury. Because Lincoln Mercury is making average products for average people and hyping them like crazy. BMW gives the ad money to the engineers and calls it engineering when it's really marketing. Making a car worth talking about. You don't want to admit it, but you are in the same business as Tommy Hilfiger and Giorgio Armani. You are taking something that's already good enough and changing it enough that people choose to talk about it. That's what you do for a living. And once you get your arms around that, you'll discover you can do it better. So let me shift gears a little bit. I want to talk about China. Now, when I first started in the Internet in 1989, I had to explain to people what email was. And I had to explain to the investors at SoftBank in 1994 that one day lots of people would have email. Now, you can go to a restaurant in Beijing and get stir-fried Wikipedia. <laughs> the, the, the shift is not trivial. The shift is what I would argue a full-blown industrial revolution. You don't get a chance to live through two in your lifetime. Sometimes you don't even get one. The last one was the birth of mass media in the 1940s. The one before that was the assembly line, Henry Ford, and mass manufacturing. But we are now right in the middle of a bigger one, I believe. And I want to spend the next 20 or so minutes talking about what that is. And the book that I wrote about is called Meatball Sunday. What a Meatball Sunday is, is the unfortunate combination of two perfectly good items. One are meatballs. Meatballs are mass market friendly, easily advertised, meat and potatoes, commodity type stuff made in quantity where quality matters and people buy it in bulk. 
our economy has been based on meatballs for a really long time. The Sunday, the topping is Twitter and blogs and new media and connecting people to each other. And lots and lots of companies who are in the meatball business have hired one or more people saying, get me some of that topping. Let's go ahead and put some of this other stuff on top. And what they end up with is a mess. What they end up with is something that doesn't work at all. That you have an opportunity now, and I hope that when you remember this conference, and I thought that was a great intro, what you remember is what I'm about to tell you in the next 45 seconds. Not to figure out how to force this new medium to your will. But you have the opportunity to build stuff that works for this new medium. And that's a totally different way of looking at the world. So let me give you an example. Let's go back in time 250 years. Josiah Wedgwood invented that horrible pottery that you probably have seen in your mother-in-law's house. Not only does it have a certain feel to it, Wedgwood China, right? But it smells different than other China because mother-in-laws tend to have it. Josiah Wedgwood was an itinerant, born an itinerant potter. His father before him was a potter. Born in an era when most people ate off a piece of stale bread and only the rich had even one plate. Born in an era where your entire life you would never go more than 10 miles from where you were born. Josiah Wedgwood looked around and saw, at the age of 15 or 20, a whole different playing field. His brother ended up doing just what his father had done. Josiah built a factory, the very first one in the world, to make pottery. He didn't have apprentices. He hired people to do one job in the factory. He one day after inventing the factory and health insurance and training, invented direct marketing. He saw that they had stamps. So he mailed a set of China to the crowned heads of Europe, each one. They're separate, not one address. And with a letter that said, this is my China. If you want more, I'm happy to sell you some. He made $2 million with that one effort, $2 million in 1700s. He started a showroom, very first one, a retail showroom where they... The salespeople were paid on commission. He invented that idea too. And the bourgeoisie came to the showroom to see the china and bought it. Josiah Wedgwood also invented quality control. He would walk around, he had a walking stick, he would walk around the factory and if he saw a piece that didn't meet his standards, he would crash it with his cane, screaming, this will not do for Josiah Wedgwood. And finally, he invented the idea of lobbying Parliament to get them to build something that would help his factory do better. He was a member of Parliament. They built a canal right by his factory so he could put the pottery on the boat and ship it around the world. Now, you can look at those things and say, those weren't marketing tactics. He actually changed what he did all day. He changed what it meant to make stuff. And that's my exact point. Josiah Wedgwood died with more real dollars in the bank than Bill Gates has today. And his grandson, Charles Darwin, used the money to change the world. The point of the story is that if all he had done was what his father had done and then tried to market it, he would have failed. That if we think about the pyramid that marketers like to think of, they put themselves at the top, sales and marketing, and us down at the bottom, coding strategy, customer service, we're not so important. Just give us what you make, give us some money, and we'll go figure out how to market it. And of course, marketers being the center of the universe, they think they have the most important part. This strategy ends up making meatballs. And that the challenge you have, and the reason I'm so delighted to talk to you, not to marketers, is that you can look at the trends, and I'm going to list a dozen right now, that have changed forever. And you say, how could I use those trends to develop a piece of software that amplifies them? As opposed to saying, How am I going to use these things to put some toppings on my meatballs? So here we go. The first one is that there is now direct communication between the user and the company. This never used to be true. So if you wanted a whole house stereo, one of those things that can play Bach in the kitchen and Beethoven in the dining room at the same time, you would call a custom installer They would come to your house, look around the house, look at your bank account, figure out how much you could afford, charge you about $100,000 to put one of these stereo systems in your house. So along comes this little company, Sonos, 
Sonos figures out that they can make a pretty good one for a thousand bucks. They go to the customer stars. The customer star says, well, that's fine, but we need a $49,000 sales commission then because we're not going to start selling a thousand dollar item and stop selling a hundred thousand dollar one. Sonos has no choice but to go directly to the consumer. Well, one way to do it is, you know, run a couple ads in a magazine. That wouldn't work. Instead, Sonos organized the whole company around the fact that they want you to call them. They're open Saturdays. Send them an email on Sunday, someone will write back. They designed the entire product to be really easy to install and set up yourself. The custom installers have no defense. They can't lower their prices. They can't improve their service. The people who sell to the custom installers are doomed because these guys figured out how to build a direct-to-user business that becomes bulletproof to the old guard. Next example, the fact that everybody is now equally loud. The fact that any customer you deal with has the ability to completely change the way the world perceives your product. Here's a video from YouTube of a Comcast technician who was going to a guy's house to install cable and fell asleep on his couch instead. The guy videotaped him sleeping on the couch. More than a million people have seen it. How much is it going to cost Comcast in marketing to undo this? There's no amount of money. The way to have undone it is to hire installers who don't fall asleep on the couch. <laughs> and it's easy to laugh at that, but what happens when I call your customer service line? I'm not sure if anyone wants to volunteer, but if I picked up my cell phone right now and we called customer service at your shop and I asked a really stupid series of questions about your software and I recorded it, would people want to hear it on YouTube? Because it's going to happen. That every interaction you have with a customer now is a chance for an up or a down. Here's a website called Run From The Border where you can go and put in from your receipt the six-digit store number from a Taco Bell and what was wrong with it when you went and file a complaint. The site's not run by Taco Bell. A disgruntled customer built a website. He collects all the complaints sends them to the health department, bundles them up, sends them to the CEO of Taco Bell because he has nothing better to do with his time. There's, there's an upside of this amplification, though. Let's say you want to go in the sock business. That's a commodity product. It's all about function. Let's go to China, get them made really cheap. Socks, avoid blisters, keep your feet from, from smelling, right? Well, what about 12-year-old girls? 12-year-old girls have a sock problem. Fashion forward, 12-year-old girls don't have enough to talk about. So a little company in Mamaroneck, New York, called littlemismatch.com, comes out with socks. Three to a container for $10. 133 styles, none of them match. So what happens is the 12-year-old girl with the fashion problem, with a not enough to talk about problem, gets a pair. Why? Because she's listening. She's choosing to pay attention. She goes to school and she says the magic words. Want to see my socks? Want to see my socks is the entire company's marketing. That's all they have. They triple in size. Every six months, they're going to do $40 million in sock revenue this year. They also make mittens and other stuff. They're growing like gangbusters. Why? Because they give people something to talk about. They don't do the marketing. The users do. The next idea is this idea of telling stories. Some of you, the most hardcore among you, will not like this idea that you are in the storytelling business. You are. Whether or not you want to be in the storytelling business, people are going to tell stories. If they're going to tell stories, you might as well build a story you want them to tell. Build the story. Live the story. True. Google Yahoo three years ago. Somebody does a study. They play with the HTML so that when you do a Yahoo search, delivers Google results, and when you do a Google search, it delivers Yahoo results. They put a bunch of people in the room and they say, which one is giving you better results? Right? Everybody picks the Google one. Why? Now, if you talk to Larry, he would say, well, you know, our engineering is the key to the whole company. Well, obviously not, because when I switched the logos, all of a sudden, the story went with the logo. The story didn't go with the code. The story matters. Living the story, breathing the story, being the story, making the story true. What is the story of what happens to people when they use your software? How does the software make the user feel? I'm not talking about consumer software as much as 
business software. If the person is sitting there using fog bugs all day, how does it make them feel as an employee? What is the story that that piece of software is giving them to tell their customer, their coworker, the other people that they want to have use it? Next idea, stolen from Chris Anderson. I'm going to assume you've all read it, but if you haven't, I'll tell you real quick. The long tail says that given enough choice, people will take the choice. Amazon gets half their revenue from books Barnes & Noble doesn't carry. Netflix gets half their rentals from titles Blockbuster doesn't carry. iTunes gets half their sales from records never once available at a Tower Records. That when you give people lots and lots and lots of choice, they take it. That this yellow part is equal in volume to the red part, and yet we're all obsessed with the red part, the short head. Not enough room for all of us in the short head. So what happens when Detroit says, all right, we're finally getting rid of the dealers. You can build and order your car online. And at no extra cost, design in any way you want. There's going to be more than a billion cars available. We'll drive it to your house in four days. Now, if you had a choice between buying that car, the one you wanted, online in that way, or going to the dealer and buying one of 12, which one would you pick for the same price? That what we see over and over and over again is that if you really like seahorse sushi, and there's a place that sells, it's not that easy to say, seahorse sushi, you're going to go there if the one across the street doesn't have it. And you all now compete in an infinite marketplace, a marketplace with infinite shelf space, a marketplace where I can buy exactly what I want. And yet, you're all making shorthead stuff, as opposed to pre-customizing a piece of software so that I can buy this one and he can buy that one. And I don't care that they're the same under the skin, what I care about is it does what I want because that's what I want. I care about me. The next one is what Google did to the world. Google sliced it into lots and lots of little bits. Now, you may remember Google in 1964 looked like this. You filled out the little form, right, in triplicate, and then you mailed it in, and six to eight weeks later, your search results came back. <laughs> Google doesn't work that way anymore. And as a result, we have to acknowledge the fact that from a marketing point of view, Google is the front door. CNET hated that. CNET fought against it until they eventually wiped out. I talked to a guy from CNET two years ago, a VP, said, I hate Google. I said, why do you hate Google? He said, because people used to come to CNET, do a search for WAN or LAN or router, and we'd own them every step along the way. Google comes along, we hate them, so we're shutting them out. We don't want to do business with anyone who's supporting Google, etc. They lost. Because you can't say to the consumer, I don't want you to go to Google when you go to look for something. They are going to go to Google. So the question is, how do you build something that they're likely to find? How do you make it so that when someone types in the magic words, you haven't won because of some SEO trickery. You've won because you deserve to be the first one for those magic words. What are you going to own? What's going to be your specialty? The next one is everyone gets their own media channel. And I wrote about um, Joel in my new book because he owns his own media channel. Joel on software doesn't have to go buy, I mean, Fog Creek doesn't have to go buy ads because they own a media channel bigger than almost any trade magazine in history. You have the opportunity to build your own, to get out of this idea of, I'm going to FedEx that editor, that's how I'm going to get noticed. This is the front door of uh, the office of one of the editors of Time Magazine. I took this picture Monday morning at 9.30. Paying FedEx $14 isn't going to get you in front of people. The next idea is a big one, a huge one for the people in this room. The idea of consumers connecting to consumers, users connecting to users. So Kiva demolishes every other charity online, even though they have no history and no momentum. Why? Because instead of saying, we're the Salvation Army, give us money, we'll figure out what to do with it, Kiva said, if you need a loan, come here. If you've got money to loan, come here, and they connect people. Compare MasterCard to PayPal. PayPal grew like crazy. Why? Because you can't use it without a partner. And if you say to someone, I want to send you money, go there to pick it up, they usually do. Fax machines took off because you can't use a fax by yourself. I want to send you a fax. I have this document. Well, I don't have a fax machine. Well, you better go buy one because I need to send you this document. The model of connecting users to each other is at the essence of how you're going to grow. The next one has more to do with which media to buy. The difference between who and how many. Most marketers are obsessed with how many. They pay extra 
to be on the Super Bowl. Not extra in aggregate, but extra per head. That makes absolutely no sense. That the goal should not be to see how many people can I interrupt. It should be who am I interrupting. This company just sold for over $100 million. Daily Candy is a very simple business. If you're not using it, pretend you're a 23-year-old fashionable woman who lives near an ocean and go sign up. What happens is you tell Danny what city you live in. You give her your email address. That's the end. You're done. Every day for the rest of your life, you will get an email with fashion tips, store openings, cool parties, etc. in your town. Not everybody gets this. Only fashion forward 23-year-old women who live near an ocean, in fact. But that's the right people. That if you're opening a Gucci store in Manhattan, you must be on her list. You will pay whatever she asks to be in that mailing. Because it's an anticipated personal and relevant message to goes, that goes to people who want to get it. This next one's more of a consumer idea, but I bet you can turn it on its head, which is that while the gulf between rich and poor continues to increase, the number of rich people also continues to increase. So people are paying three or four thousand dollars for a comic book. So people are going to a bike store in Manhattan by appointment only and spending twelve thousand dollars for a bicycle. That when you think about the software you make, maybe there's a market of corporations that would happily pay $100,000 for something that only 20 of them want, as opposed to forcing yourself to believe it has to be $29 because all software is free. All software doesn't have to be free if it's exactly what I need at exactly the right place and generating huge amounts of value to me and my organization. This next one goes back to this idea of getting in to see the IT guy, the VP CIO. How are you going to make the big business-to-business -business sale? The gatekeeper used to matter a great deal. The gatekeeper controlled everything back in the day. But now, the gatekeepers are being replaced by leaders. Leaders who are coming maybe from the bottom up, maybe sideways. They're not who you think they are. You will find them faster if you become one. If you become somebody who's leading people through this, you'll discover the other people. And those people are the ones most likely to spread your story. And one bonus one, which I call the Seinfeld curve. Now, the Seinfeld curve describes the market for Jerry Seinfeld's product. If you want to watch Seinfeld on TV, it's free. 500 cities once or twice a day, right? It's ubiquitous. If you want to see Jerry Seinfeld live, 250 bucks, Las Vegas, you got to fly there. There is no $90 Seinfeld product, right? That's the black hole in the middle. You can't make money over there. You make money by being ubiquitous, Googleicious, everywhere. You make money by being scarce, by selling souvenirs, by being bespoke. But in the middle, it's really difficult to make money. So where does that leave us? Well, we're in Boston. I'll talk about Gillette. 100 years ago, 80 years ago, King Gillette comes up with a great invention, builds the best razor blade factory of all time comes up with a great marketing gimmick, give away the razors, sell the blades. Comes up with a great marketing gimmick, sponsors the, the prize fights. Comes up with another marketing gimmick, sponsors NFL. Billion dollar company. So now all this new stuff comes along and the guys at Gillette say, how are we going to get our fair share of attention? The guys at Gillette say, how are we going to grow? No one's watching TV anymore. The answer, of course, is build a fancy website. No, it's not. That's how you build a meatball Sunday. The answer is either acknowledge that you had the right product for the right time but no longer and take your profits or figure out you better build something new. It might be an online fashion magazine that has nothing to do with selling razors. It might be something else that works in this new medium. But acknowledge most of all you have no right to put on a fancy, expensive show on the internet and expect people will tune in, watch it, and then run to the drugstore and buy a razor. So I run a little company called Squidoo. We got five or six people, and we're in the top three or 400 worldwide in terms of traffic and growing. And the reason is because we looked at all these rules and built an organization around them, as opposed to saying, how can we build whatever we feel like and then market our way to success? Or remember we were talking about Wedgwood? If you were at your mother-in-law's and you broke that piece of china, you would need to replace it. 
Where? At Replacements.com, a long tail company that's doing millions and millions of dollars of profit. They did 64,000 auctions on eBay alone by themselves last year. That teacup will cost you 38 bucks. Now, if you need that teacup, you don't have a lot of choice. And if you buy it for 38 bucks and your mother-in-law forgives you, who are you going to tell? Everyone. And so the word spreads. Zappos.com appears to be a shoe store. It's not. What it is, is a software company that's in the satisfaction business. My wife works, is friends with a woman who works with someone who every Monday buys three pairs of shoes from Zappos. Wears them all week in the office and on Friday ships them back for a full refund. <laughs> now, Zappos must know that this woman is a thief. They must. And yet they let her keep doing it. Why? Because everyone's going to tell everyone. Because now there's no doubt about their return policy. Because now it's really clear that when you call that 800 number, and yes, it's in big numbers, in Spanish and English, on their homepage, they want you to call them. Because every time someone calls them, it dramatically increases the chances that that person becomes a customer for life. It is not an expense. It's a marketing investment. They win. Yeah, they're a software company that just happens to sell shoes to women who are addicted to shoes. So I guess if I'm going to summarize this, I'm going to use two different slides. The first one is this. Right now, the mindset is, how can I find more customers for our product? And I'm begging you instead to realize that maybe you should start thinking about how do I find more products for my customers? Because share of wallet is way easier than share of market. Because you've already done a really hard thing, which is earning the trust and attention of a group of people. And they have a bunch of problems they'd like to have you solve for them. The second one is, are we going to be able to say to our boss, or if you're the boss, I need to go do this, and she'll say, nope, you've got to prove it works first. Or are we going to be lucky enough to realize that the way we're going to succeed is by committing? That no company starts a blog and integrates it into their entire corporation and has it pay off in a week or a month or a year. My blog didn't pay off for four. Right? But I committed to it long before it turned to a success. The people who are failing are the ones who, ref who refuse to acknowledge that. Threadless is a software company that sells souvenir T-shirts. Coincidentally, they're also going to do $40 million in revenue this year. Why? They organized a company using software around spreading the word. So the way Threadless works is you submit a T-shirt design, thousands of people do every week, and if your design gets the most votes, you get a thousand bucks in cash. Well, game the system, right? So what they do is people go and tell their friends, go vote for me. Every single one of the thousand designs happens to be for sale. So when they're busy voting and looking around, they go, oh, maybe I'll buy this one. And so the company grows. It's a software company following a new cycle. The new cycle looks like this. Step one, be remarkable. That step is the hardest one and the one that most people skip. If you can't do step one, you got to start over. You must make a product that the use of the product requires or cajoles or encourages people to talk about it. The second step is tell a story about that product to people who want to hear it. An anticipated personal and relevant story about stuff they're interested in that they want to tell to their friends. People like telling other people stuff. Step three, they do what used to be your job. They go out and tell other people about you. And then some of those other people go back to you and give you permission to tell them the next story. Right? So I made it through a whole speech without talking about Apple. But that's what Apple does, isn't it? Isn't this step by step what Apple does with every single product that they launch? Didn't most of the people who bought an iPhone also have an iPod? And many of them also have a Mac, even though the products are completely unrelated? Sure, because it's the same cycle over and over and over again. It's the opposite of what built Revlon, but it's the same thing that's building great companies one after another. So if you want one company to look at to rip off from top to bottom, it's 37 Signals. Go take a look at what 37 Signals did. Not to promote a product that was already done, but to decide what to build. 
to decide how to build it, decide how to price it, to integrate with their customers, to give their customers tools to spread the word. Every single person who uses Basecamp has persuaded at least five other people to also use it because it doesn't work if they don't. Many people have persuaded thousands of people to use it. And then when someone else is persuaded to use Basecamp on Project A and now they need to do Project B, what else are they going to use? So right under Microsoft's nose, right under the nose of a company that should own this entire thing, every one of their four top products, they built it for nothing. Bit by bit, step by step. Take a look at the old versus the new. And I'm not going to read each one to you, but figure out which side of the line are you on. I think we can all agree that the left side all worked 50 years ago. And I think we can all agree that 10 years from now, the right side is clearly where the world is going to be. So, you probably haven't seen it laid out in green and black before, but there it is. You got to make a decision. And none of this, none of it, has to do with whether or not you should buy an ad in computer reseller news. None of it has to do with what kind of web design you ought to have on your site to increase your search engine traffic. So, I've been going on for 45 or so minutes. We're going to have a quick little vote. I can either stop and take questions, which I love to do, or show you a preview of a dozen slides from the new work I'm working on. So we're going to take a vote. First, for questions, raise your hand. And for the other stuff. <laughs> okay. I'm flattered and honored. Thank you. Now, we, we just have to agree, no one's going to blog about this, please. No photos, none of that, okay? Because I'm really trying to just take it on the road and work it out slowly. Is that fair? Anybody want to object? Okay. So, most organizations have said what we need to do is connect ourselves more deeply with our customers. That we need to build a database, we need to figure out how to interrupt them, we need to figure out how to sell more stuff. But what's really fascinating is that the successful organizations are the ones who are connecting users to each other. That what happens when a tribe forms, and there's lots and lots and lots of tribes, thousands of them, from the Red Hat Society to people who are into Olympic kayaking to people who are fans of Microsoft to people who don't like Microsoft, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These tribes thrive. You can go to a Starbucks in a city you've never been to before and see a fellow Starbucksian and you know who they are, right? They're ordering a, a red eye with four extra shots in it. And you feel comfortable even talking to them. You can buy a pair of Newton running shoes for 175 bucks. And when you're running down the, the, the running path, even though no one has waved or smiled at you the whole running path, you see someone else in a pair of Newtons and you're in the tribe. That they made it easy for you to connect with each other. So if you're going to build a tribe, the first question you've got to ask yourself is, are we going to make it easy to get in? Are we going to make this trivial to join? Or are we going to make it really hard to get in? So, Hare Krishnas have made it really hard. Hare Krishnas have made a tight tribe. You've got to shave your head, wear those outfits, do the dancing in the street, and become a vegetarian. Not easy, but tight. Oprah Winfrey has a much, much bigger tribe, but not so tight. The most she could ever ask you to do is buy a book or two. So when you're thinking about building these tribes, you need to make some hard decisions about what kind of tribe are you going to leave. A lot of times we say, did I just jump a page? I thought I did. No. A lot of times we ask ourselves, well, how do we do this? What are the tactics of doing it? And so, you know, I built this Ning group and I've got 3,400 people in it. The average post, if you see here on the side, you know, every seven or 10 minutes in the middle of the night, people are posting. The average person spends 12 minutes a visit, looks at 12 pages. Things are constantly spiraling, 71 replies to each post. Those are all how-to things, and they're completely irrelevant because the real thing you have to do is figure out how not to be mediocre, that nobody joins a tribe that's average. Nobody says, yeah, I really want to be part of this group. We're the average ones that what people do when they start joining a tribe, when they commit to it, when they invest their time, when they talk about it, is because it's something they believe in. Right? It's the difference, as we're going to hear later, between the iPod and the Zoom. 
because it's an identity thing. You are joining that tribe. And we used to only have three tribes we could join. Work, community, and church. And now there's millions of tribes to choose from. And when we join a tribe, we're making a statement about ourselves. So who runs these tribes? Who leads them? Well, this is the tricky part. It turns out it comes from a place of being a heretic. Martin Luther was a heretic. Martin Luther stood up and was excommunicated for doing a whole bunch of things that didn't match the prevailing wisdom of the time. But he found people to join his tribe because he stood apart from it, as opposed to what I call sheepwalking. Doing what you're told the same way as yesterday. Following the manual. Reading a dummy's book. Going step by step. Jim Morrison has plenty of people visiting his grave and leaving things behind. Because in his day, he was arrested and he was booed and people didn't think that he was playing properly. Right? He was a heretic. Heretics attract tribes because they're challenging the status quo. Now what we see is that faith and religion aren't the same thing. Faith is believing in tomorrow, in being sure that the path you're on is going to work. Religion are the rules that we've set up to amplify faith. But what heretics do is they challenge the rules of the, of the established religion, whether it's a real religion or a corporate religion or a cultural religion. Another way to say it is you've got to be careful that your karma doesn't step on my dogma, and vice versa. That what matters if you want to build one of these tribes is that you have to stand up for something remarkable and the people who want to follow you will if you can get the rules out of the way. So I want to give you a couple quick examples. A friend of mine, a designer named Red Maxwell, his daughter Cassie, who's a wonderful little girl, has juvenile diabetes. Red has been volunteering for JDRF for years, and he's tired of the bureaucracy. So Red leads a tribe of similarly motivated people from around the world, all of whom are volunteering, raising millions of dollars to change the status quo because they're pushing against something and they're working for something. Jacqueline Novogratz runs the Acumen Fund. You can find it at acumenfund.org. And she is developing the third world in a way fundamentally opposed to the way CARE and other traditional nonprofits do it. And she's able to build this vibrant, growing organization because they stand for something, because they're leaning into a new kind of change. So the very people who would never think of saying, I'm in the tribe of people who have been doing the same sort of volunteer work for 100 years, will eagerly follow Jacqueline because she connects interesting people to each other, because she gets out of the way. She establishes a vision and says, go ahead. We can all do this together. Or just to go something a little bit more, more mundane. Jimmy Buffett, what does he do for a living? What he does is he connects parrot heads to each other. Right? What Jimmy Buffett does is throw a party every night somewhere in this country. And people who go to that party, tens of thousands of them at a time, buy souvenirs while they're there. But they also enjoy meeting each other. They make friends for life. Because those people like the connection they get from being in the same tribe. The last example I'll give you, a guy named Nathan Winograd. Nathan Winograd worked at the SPCA in San Francisco and discovered that every year, SPCAs across the United States and other animal shelters kill four million dogs and cats. That, in fact, that's why they were started, to get strays off the street and destroy them. And that's where their funding comes from, and it's where their culture is. And Nathan Winograd said, no, that's not okay. And working with his boss, he transformed San Francisco into a no-kill city. They went from killing 80 to 90% of the animals that they rescued to four, only the violent ones, only the ones that couldn't be treated. And all the people said it couldn't be done, that he couldn't afford it. He had no trouble ever raising money. The other SPCAs came to hearings to testify against him, which did nothing but help him build his tribe of people who wanted his effort to succeed. When he left San Francisco, Everyone said that couldn't, it could only work in a big liberal city. He went to Tompkins County, New York, very rural, where everyone carries a shotgun, and did it again. And then he left there, and he went to North Carolina, a mid-sized city, and did it again. And then he went to Nevada and did it again. And each place where he does it, he does it in a way where it's not about Nathan. It's about creating this tribe in the community that connects to each other and gets something done. Now, some of these examples are titanic examples about changing the world. Your software might not be doing that. But what we see 
using the Apple example again, is you can make money doing this if you're enriching your customers' lives and connecting them to each other. Thank you for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Great. We'll do five minutes of Q&A, they say, which would be great for me. So you have to ask your questions loudly and quickly. Go, sir. What's a sneezer? A sneezer. An idea virus is, an, uh, is a meme that spreads from person to person like a virus. A sneezer is the kind of person who communicates a lot of virus when they walk around. So that if you realize that most of your customers never speak about what you do, they're very shy about what they do. Other people love to stand up at conferences and talk about how great your stuff is. Sun Microsystems runs a conference. People from all over fly in at their own expense to stand up and talk about how they're using Sun equipment. Those people are sneezers. Now, you can have passive sneezers. When Apple brought out the iPod, they used white headphones. So you looked around the gym, you were thinking about it being an MP3 player, you're not sure which one to buy. All the cool people have white headphones. They're sneezing without even knowing it. Or you can just reward people. You can celebrate people. You can put them on your website and in your brochure. Help them spread the word. That's what a sneezer is. Yes, sir? Sure. So the idea of permission is, if you read my blog once, that was your choice. If you subscribe to my blog, you've given me permission every single day, dripping into your RSS reader. That's an asset for me because I've earned your attention. Permission is the opposite of spam. So when Amazon sends you that note every day saying, you know, this is what people are buying today, blah, 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 some people look forward to it. If it didn't show up, they'd complain. That's permission. That the asset you must build if you're going to be able to, to launch new products and grow is that the people who you currently have the right to talk to want to hear from you. Real permission has nothing to do with the privacy policy. What it means is people would complain if you didn't show up. Yes, sir. What a great question. Why does a remarkable company like JetBlue get more and more mediocre over time? It happens all the time. And the reason is because of Wall Street, because of management, because of fear. And if you want to reach the masses, you better have something the masses want to buy. So you must get away from the edges, the things that might be controversial, the things that might lose money in the short run, the things that might get you in trouble, because all the new parties that are playing with you because you're big don't want you to go there. So we see that with a politician. When they're first starting in the primaries, they're way out at the edges because those are the people who are willing to listen. As they get more and more popular, they've got to go closer and closer to the center. We get what we deserve because we punish people who act in a remarkable way when they go to the center. The good news is none of you need to be as big as JetBlue ever. And that what you can build is a company for the ages that stays remarkable. And there are still examples of that out there. But you can't do that and go public and have your stock go up every day for 10 years. You can't do both at the same time. Yes, sir. Well, the, the tribe that I built is by invitation only. So there's only 3,000 people and you can't join. That changes everything. Because once it's closed, number one, people don't want to get thrown out, which means that you can challenge people to do certain things or not because there's something at stake. Number two, you don't have to worry about the idea of people driving by, throwing a rock, and driving away. So the comments on YouTube are fundamentally different than the comments on my tribe. Because everybody knows everyone, everyone's a real person with a real face, and if you misbehave, we're going to excommunicate you, you're gone. The end result is real mature conversation all the time, and lots of people in gentle competition with each other to have more impact. Whereas my problem with Facebook, and if I've ever friended you on Facebook, I apologize for what I'm going to say, I don't have any friends on Facebook. If you friend me, I'll say, okay, because I don't want to offend you, but I'm not going to ask anybody there for a real favor. Because who are they? I don't know. And so the relationship is very, very casual. And that's, I think, a fundamental distinction. One of your jobs when you build a tribe is to tighten it. And you tighten it in lots of ways by removing anonymity and by putting something at stake. Yes, sir. When somebody comes to you with something that is clearly not remarkable, how do you break it to them? And what do you advise them to do? So, <laughs> so the, qu the question is, what, what do I do if someone says something? Well. What I do is irrelevant. I don't do any consulting, so I have nothing to lose. I just tell them. What should you do, I think, is the real question. 
And my answer is what I call edge crafting, which is lots of people can be successfully challenged to go to the edges. So if somebody runs a restaurant that's open 12 hours a day, you could say, well, if you open 15 hours a day, 16, and then you go, oh, I could be open all the time, right? Or, you know, you serve spicy chili. What if the chili was even spicier? Spicier, spicier. And so there's lots of ways to get more in any given direction. So at JetBlue, Amy Curtis, who was their VP of training and marketing, which is a great thing to have one person do both jobs, said, wait, we're not going to give free snacks. We're going to give unlimited free snacks. We're going to reward flight attendants for giving extra free snacks. Go to the edges. United is afraid to go to the edges. JetBlue could afford to go to the edges, so they did. How do you, it's always about more. How do you take it to 11? Not in every direction, but in a direction. And then you can work with that person to get out of their safety zone into a place where people want to talk about it. The timer says I'm done. I got to go. Thank you again. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks a lot.